Well, we've only got a couple more derivative rules to learn, and tonight we're going to check another one off the list. Today we're going to focus on deriving the natural log function. And uh, very nice, straightforward rule. We're going to introduce you to the rule. We're going to practice using it, and then we're going to try to throw some curveballs at you and see if you can adjust and handle those. But uh, you know, one thing you notice, just to recap a lot of the things we already know about the natural log function, we, we've emphasized the asymptotic behavior here with respect to the y-axis. We've emphasized the x-intercept, and we've emphasized the fact that this function is increasing, but at a decreasing rate. And um, But this picture here, I liked it because it kind of exemplified it, the particular slopes at individual points. For instance, if I'm standing down here at x equals 1 fourth, the curve is actually pretty steep right there and it has a slope of 4, they're saying. And then if I go up a little bit, when x equals 1 third, the slope is 3, and when x equals 1 half, the slope is 2. And I think you'll notice a certain pattern here. It seems like the, uh, the slopes are reciprocals of the particular x values. For instance, right here when x equals 2, the slope is 1 half, and then the slopes, they remain positive, but they get flatter and flatter and closer and closer to horizontal. Now, with that being said, let me introduce you to, uh, let me run an interesting limit question by you. What if we wanted the limit as x approaches infinity for f prime of x, assuming that f of x is the natural log function? Well, what you'll notice by this particular graph is that as x gets bigger and bigger, the slopes, aka f prime, are approaching zero. Okay, so here's what the rule says. The rule says if you want to take the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of x, it's just going to be 1 divided by x. There's the reciprocal property we just saw on the last page. And then to get a little more general, let's say you want to have the natural log of some u. What we're going to do is we're going to derive the u and then divide by u. Interestingly enough, there are no natural logs in the answer to your derivative, and of course u is a function of x. All right, let's go practice some. All right, here's two nice ones to warm up. Um, if, it, if it helps, just remind yourself that in this first example, the u is referring to the quantity 2x. It's the quantity that you're taking the natural log of, and in this case, 2x. So what I'm going to say here is my derivative is the derivative of u divided by u itself, which simplifies to simply 1 over x. Now, interestingly enough, if I had taken the original function and before doing any calculus, if, what if I used my natural log properties from Algebra 2? I could have expanded this and said it's the natural log of 2 plus the natural log of x. And the natural log of 2 is a constant, so his derivative would have been 0. And then the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. Notice I get the same answer that I did in the, the first example when I simplified it. On our second example, the u is referring to the quantity x squared plus 1. So the derivative is going to be my du divided by u itself. And there's no simplifying on this one. Interestingly enough, the log properties don't help me on that first one because of the plus sign inside there. There's nothing I could have done to expand it. Um, it was already done, as I like to say. All right, in example number three, just ask yourself how you would read it. What we've got here is we've got x times the natural log of x, so we recognize instantly the need for product rule. I don't think there's any shortcuts around it. There's no way to avoid it, so we're going to dive in, and I'm going to say it's the first function times the derivative of the second plus the second function times the derivative of the first. Very nicely, those first two terms can be multiplied to form a 1, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is our derivative there. Um, in number four, I've posed two examples, and I want you to really pay attention to the location of the cube sign and ask yourself what exactly is getting cubed. So on this one on the, on the left side, I would say that only the x is getting cubed. And in this particular, I am allowed to use my log properties where I bring the 3 down, and then I get ready to do some calculus and derive. So it's going to be 3 times this guy's derivative, which is 1 over x, and of course my final answer is 3 over x. Now, I, I would have gotten the same answer even if I didn't use my log property, so let's pretend that I didn't use my log property, and I just wanted to do du over u right from the get-go. Um, you know, the x cubed would have been my u, and so I could have said du all over u, and then we simplify and get 3 over x again, so you notice I did get the same answer. Okay, now compare that to the one, let's see, Try to find a fun color here for you. This one is saying that the entire 
function natural log of x is getting cubed as opposed to just the x being cubed on that one on the left. So I'm going to use my chain rule and I'm going to say 3 times that inner function now squared times the derivative of the inside and that's about as cute as we could make it look. In our next example you're going to see a situation where you can make your life a lot easier if we take advantage of those log properties from Algebra 2. We've got the natural log of radical x plus 1. So now you could jump right into your derivative right now, unfortunately. You could say to yourself, well, my u is radical x plus 1. So then you, you could run through your du over your u. And uh, the bear trap is, first of all, your du is going to require chain rule. And then even if you do get du over u, there's going to be so much simplifying and you're going to really be burdened down with the algebra and arithmetic and stuff that it's going to take you a lot of time. And it's one of those cases where, you, yes, you will get the right answer, but you'll do so, you know, two minutes later. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to suggest that before we even think about calculus, let's just rewrite it as one half times the natural log of x plus one. All right. And watch how much easier this gets. Okay, so my derivative says the coefficient comes along for the ride. I've got my du over my u. And now this, it almost becomes laughable how easy it is. Now compare that to, you know, doing the derivative right from the get-go and how much, you know, cleaning up you'd have to do to make it look just like this one. Again, we're going to focus on using our log properties to set us up for an easier path. Uh, this particular function is extremely obnoxious. Whoops, I almost forgot my ln that's in there. So we've got the natural log of x times the quantity x squared plus 1 squared all over radical 2x cubed minus 1. So right now, your u um, is everything inside the square brackets, and if you were going to derive that, you'd have quotient rule, and in the midst of that quotient rule, you'd have some product rule and some chain rule sprinkled in there. So, I mean, you can only imagine. I mean, your imagination doesn't even begin to describe how painful that derivative would be. So I'm going to use my log properties to expand this. And I'm going to say it's the natural log of x plus 2 times the natural log of x squared plus 1. That's expanded as much as it can there. Minus 1 half natural log of the quantity 2x cubed minus 1. Now the derivative, the calculus part of it becomes almost laughable. We've got 1 over x plus 2 times, let's see, du over u. And again, the coefficient comes along for the ride, and we've got our du over our u. And, uh, you know, we could simplify a touch, you know, we could say, well, this becomes a 4, the 1 half kills that, and makes it a 3, you know, and so forth. But other than that, that's about all we're going to do. One of the more challenging problems we, we see each year is what I call a na uh, nested natural log. And what by that I mean it's the natural log of the natural log of x. Okay, so we're taking the natural log of a natural log. So in this particular example, I want you to tell yourself that this is my u. Okay, so as we derive, we're going to do, you know, the derivative of u all over u itself. When I say the derivative of u, we're going to derive that expression, which is simply 1 over x. And as we clean up this complex fraction, I get 1 over x, the natural log of x. So that one can kind of be a mind twister. Um, just, you know, identify who your u is and just, you know, derivative of u over u itself, and we get a nice clean expression. Something else that you might see on these particular functions is a lot of times they might say like the natural log of the absolute value of cosine and a lot of times students panic with these absolute values and they think they, they have to use some special rule and, and whatnot. The reason, the only reason they're putting the absolute values in there is because um, some, you know, sometimes cosine produces negative values and, and we're not allowed to take the natural log of negative values and so we've kind of as an insurance policy we've placed those absolute values around cosine just to ensure that it produces positive re answers. But as far as our derivative, it's still going to be the derivative of u divided by u itself. And in this particular example, we could simplify it to negative tangent. So there's just an example where I don't want you to panic with those absolute values in a natural log. It doesn't change how we approach our derivative. Okay, our last one for tonight, we've got y equals the natural log of the quantity x squared plus 2x plus 3. My first question is, are we allowed to use our log properties to expand this one? Well, there are no properties that apply to this. Um, you'll notice um, you can expand the natural log of a times b 
but you cannot expand the natural log of a plus b. There is no rule that applies to that one. So just get that one out of your head. We're stuck with this one the way it is. Uh, relative extrema includes both relative maxes and relative mins. So my game plan is to find that first derivative, uh, find my critical points, and then construct my sign chart. So my derivative is going to be du all over u itself. Really an effortless derivative. Um, I'm going to set this bar equal to zero in an effort to find the critical points. As I cross multiply, the denominator fades away. Um, we factor out the twos and so forth, and we got x equals negative one as a critical point. And we got a nice little sign chart cooking. Derivative on top, fun original function on the bottom. Let's see, what could we plug into that derivative? Let's plug in, you know, maybe a negative three. Let's see, and if I substitute a negative 3 into this expression right here, I've got a negative numerator, and let's see, I've got positive 9 minus 6 plus, I've got a positive denominator, so if I divide those, I get a negative result, so y is decreasing. And then on the other side, I'll plug in a 0, and it looks like I'm going to get 2 over 3, which is positive, so now the function's increasing. So I just decided that we've got a relative, oh goodness, what? Hope I, hope I didn't screw that up. I just hit something. Okay. I've decided I've got a relative min. F of x or y equals has a relative min at x equals negative 1 because f prime, or in this case y prime, changed from negative to positive. It's as simple as that. Boom. So I hope you feel pretty confident with your natural log. I tried to throw a variety of examples at you, and tomorrow we'll rock and roll and go get them.